Hi, everyone. I want to welcome you as we celebrate what would have been Jack Kerouac's 100th birthday today. I wish he was here to be with us, but he is here in spirit. And um, while he was alive, I've come to know since reading about him and listening to interviews that he never thought that anyone appreciated everything that he wrote about. Um, he thought he would never be remembered, but he is remembered. And I founded this organization basically because of him. And um, to give tribute to him, I'm gonna read um, not something of his, but something that I had written and it pertains to basically what all the beats, the past and the present, probably have gone through since they um, started writing. Okay, I'm gonna read, I am beat. I must admit, I am beat. Beaten down by experience, smashed to bits, ground down by pestle and mortar, made into a chalky paste like pesto without the pine, an empty cone of intricate webs, a cocoon turned to stone. There is no escape, only hope that the layers that peel off my parchment do not take me down Kerouac Lane left to howl at a generation beaten down and poor, but made renewed, sympathetic, pure, as was intended. A new generation forged from stones, but crushed into clay, made pliable, ready for change, sculpted from ashes, rising up in waves, Renewed by waters, a jazzy ensemble pounding to the beat. So I'm gonna welcome everybody today and I hope you enjoy uh, the celebration with us. Thanks. Hi, I'm Anne Caroline from uh, Thessaloniki, Greece. Sincere thanks for including me. I consider this as an opportunity for people to share thoughts and experiences. Uh, congratulations on the organization and the homely atmosphere. The poem is part of an anthology of poems about the hometown published uh, in 2019 called Thessaloniki of the Poets. Uh, the neighborhood be described as real. This was the area offered to the Greek refugees from Asia Minor after their eviction from their homeland exactly 100 years ago. It was a non-fertile, boggy, non-residential region. In the area, there were three military camps, a psychiatric hospital, an asylum for the old, insane, and the paupers. Last, Three tobacco factories were spread within the region where local women worked hard and under filthy conditions. The touch of the city, polis. Why I don't write about my home city, the polis. The one I lived in as a child and a woman. Its castles and its fortresses didn't touch me. They show them now to the tourists copies of copper and clay into the pockets of the American Indians who take their revenge. Neither my neighborhood did I love, surrounded by barracks and institutions, dawns, rehearsal for parades or coups. The clinking plank of tanks still echo in my ears, the nights that I think that I'm, as I'm asleep, the people, with their deranged eyes, their saliva licking the chin after the electrocution. 
every day I walked up to school, them begging for a penny to phone their mum, to ask her to take them away from there, the institution. How many meanings did this world acquire in my mind? For eternally insane or penniless homeless, for deserted in madness of a generation impotently wronged. War creates mad people. It is that this city never hugged me and let me alone to discover it, but I didn't know how till I found myself in the city, the polis, Constantinopolis, in one of its little lanes. I got charmed. I was looking at the names of the streets and they were familiar, full of live spirits calling me, dances and flirting and jewels, golden sovereigns shameless passions and flesh, female flesh, deeply power, powdered, but also blood, unreasoned blood to confuse me and mixed yet with, with the other sense of the spices in the square, all one blend, all one karma. And when there in Bosporus, I glanced at the sea, I stood still and said, Leave me here. Here is where I belong. Although the rest of us were staring, staring, startled. Have you been here before? Memory may be lost. But the experience of the non-sleeping flesh wakened the soul in the century that seeks for the signs of the ages. And now came the ages within their signs lifted me up but didn't put me back to ground left me there enchanted by the beautiful city impotent in words humans who lived in the blood of their spaces leaned on its divine and ancient innards in an appeal to the unknown god the god of innards one fate it's only the misguided of the past senses who were gifted to experience this as the touch of the city sent in a message. There you stay, even though you're gone generations before. This is the police, and this is you with your guts and your sensors on the alert. There. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Carlos the Unhappy from the Forest of Dean on the border of Wales and England. And I've just got back from the uh, Kerouac 100 celebrations in Oxford and read there. And it's great to see that uh, so many people turning out to celebrate Jack. I'm going to read a couple of Jack's uh, haiku uh, in a moment. Um, but I got two poems of my own, both about Jack. One, the first one I've written specifically for this day. Um, so it may be in some future collection uh, at some point or other. And it's called The Silent Road Song, March 12, 1922. And it goes like this. Oh, Jack Kerouac, safe in heaven dead, your journey life of suffering duca, your searching, finding and losing, your pain and beatitude, longing, handsome face, piety, you, you writ down Samsara Universe's roar of crashing surf at Big Sur. Writ down drunk, drink drunk, the mountain top snow melt. Or as boy in depression era rain along Moody Street, cathedral looming, stars above the street lamp night, mournful tones of bird ballads to come. All set sail this day, March 1922. And you, shy, confused, excited and lonely, shared music of words as images of life and self-legend existence journey, sang London-esque, Wolfian, new Proustian bop prose, long lonely nights of boyhood, all life without your brother dead age nine, sound of father's print shop, mother at the sink, stars above the pines, motion of the midnight special under the sad moon of America, her majesty be. Meditations on the raw suffering of this world, 
meditations of the born alone shadows to die, but you, Christ-loving, sweet desolation angel of our mind, you set sail the song. First one, thank you. Nice. Thank you. Uh, second one uh, is... Ah, okay, sorry, sorry. Wait, I thought you finished. You ready? Yes. Okay. Second poem is a lament for Jack. And this goes back to uh, consider four years before his moment of actual death and maybe the turning point. And it mentions uh, a couple of titles of um, works that influenced Jack, such as um, some work of Jack London and Walt Whitman. So look out for those. And it goes like this, just called Jack Kerouac, uh, part of a triptych of lament. And it goes like this. Morning rain on the grass isn't rain, but dew, the night residue. Hot coffee soothes the haunting booze, yawn, the bird song. Think of Kerouac waking in a field, his soul already seeping. Death, the drink death, pouring stars down his throat like sand, bitter cloying clay. You can't go home again, lost. Leaves of grass, lost. His own words unable to rise, a drunk, itching heart, messy, confused. When did you see sea and the angels? You lie in dew, come to, no holy vision. Only four more slow years now to go, then rest. Christ on the cross climbing down, the small hand of Gerard at last, slips into yours but for now buddha has prepared a blanket of you of dew just for you taijan look homeward angel and just before we go i promised you a couple of uh, kerouac haikus uh, so here's a couple i can do off the top of my head useless useless heavy rain driving into the sea and probably his most famous Western haiku, in my medicine cabinet, the winter fly has died of old age. Happy birthday, Jack, and thanks everyone. Hi, this is Bengt from Sweden, Bengt of Björklund, Beatful Laureate of Sweden. Um, Jack Kerak meant a lot to me in my incarcerated years in Istanbul. Um, he gave me freedom, though I was locked up. I'm going to read a few short poems on my own. And the first one goes like this. There's a machine on the run, leveling illusions, the magnificent scope of dreams, feeding the collective with a sense of belonging. Seduction is on the run, feeding us all with beauty and awe, piling days ticking and tribes looking for more than stale crumbs. The distance between here and what will follow is a dance in perfect silence. There's fading graffiti on the old wooden gates, close to most. Wrought like a thought on fire, screaming like a sentinel plummeting from the turret. I will not join my hands, nor sail to the sound of prayers in a world so indifferent. Stranded in a soporific vision where I is just a spectator, spectator watching the world revolve around a speck of shiny dust. I see you move towards me and that is all it takes for despair to dissipate and it is all my lungs need to meet yet another day. And this is the last one. Laid out in husky words crying, 
She rolled the sky in too late goodbye, telling all that would hear tales of a walker, presenting times passing as an orange on the beach. Straddled over and over, she now walks in different shadows, misplacing thoughts on purpose. She talks of magic while the rest of the night crumbles. There's a certain notion running around in the villages of the poor and the lost that the ruler in place feeds on the blood of children ripping meadows apart. Rampant searchers of reflections scramble their eggs in fear and war once again rose dark thunder over turrets and pinnacles. It is time to reconsider it all. Thank you. The Three Stooges Holy Goof. This is from Kerouac's Vision of Cody. But the latest and perhaps really best vision was the vision I had of Cody one drowsy afternoon in January on the sidewalks of Orchidae, San Francisco. What the Three Stooges are like when they go staggering and kicking each other down the street. <clears throat> we had just blasted in the car as we drove down the hill into wild mid-market traffics and out past third, past the dingy bars with their incredible names like Moonlight in Colorado, Mid Blue Midnight or Pink Glass, and inside it's all wretched raw brown whiskey and mo boiler makers. Past Mission Street too, with its, co with its corner conglomerate of bums of dragging old winos so torpid that when pretty women pass, they don't even look. They seem to be too guilty to look at ordinary women. Only steamboat annies of high front bouges with knots in their sticks for calf muscles and hagless tooth marks in their purpley gums. We came to the rail yards where they we worked and crossed the warm, airy plazas of the day and how in our lives together, we were always finding ourselves on a golden, sleepy, good afternoon like the afternoons that must have been experienced by those noble sons of great Homeric warriors that wild night characterizing and charactering across the ghosts and white horses of phallic classical fate. Just like that, Cody and me, only American. And it came into Cody's head to imitate the stagger of the Three Stooges. And he did it, wild, crazy, yelling in the sidewalk right there by the arches and by hurrying executives, his eyes popping in a hard exercise of staggering, his whole frame of clothes capped by those terrible pants with seven holes in them and streaked with baby food, cum, ice cream, gasoline, ashes. And I saw them spring into being into the, in the side of Cody in the street. Mo, the leader, mopish, Maori, moop-mouthed, mealy, mad, hanking, making the mothers quake, whacking curly on the iron pate, Backhanded Larry, who wonders, picking up a sledgehammer, honk, and ramming it down, nozzle first on the flat pan of Curly's skull. Boing, and all the big, dumb convict Curly does is muckle and yuckle and squeal, pressing his lips, shaking his old butt like jelly, nodding his jello fist, sighing mo, who looks back at him with that lowered and surly, well, what are you going to do about it? And it gets worse, and it gets worse, an innocent thumbing, which leads to backhand, then the pastries, then the nose yanks, black, blue, gong, going, gong. And now they do muckle and moan and pull and mop about in an underground hell of their own invention. And Cody was with them, laughing and staggering in savage mimicry of them, bopping with another so much that now they've learned not only how to master the styles of the blows, but the symbol and acceptance of them also. And then I knew that long ago when the mist was raw and Cody stood outside a pawn shop or hardware store or in that perennial pool hall door or maybe under tragic rainy telephone calls and thought of the three studios suddenly realizing that yes, life 
is strange and the three stooges really exist. And in 10,000 years, all the goofs he felt in him were justified to the outside world and he had nothing to be reproach himself for. Bonk, boring, crash, skiddly-boo, pow, slam, bang, boom, wham, blam, crack, crap, kerplunk, clatter, clap, flap, flap, slap, map, splat, crunch, crouch, bong, split, splat, bong. Jack Killer. Searching for Jack Kerouac, visited San Francisco, flew to Chicago, on to Oakland, California, over Bay Bridge, wandered North Beach, San Francisco, way down with heavy words on the road. Where is Jack Kerouac? In Canada, Lowell, New York City, North Carolina, Denver, San Francisco, Mexico City, St. Petersburg, Bones. White, light, white, he bones, Jack Kerouac's bones in Lowell, Massachusetts, where the road begins and ends. And I'm searching for Jack Kerouac out west, as west as west can be west and still be in the olding USA. There's the Pacific Ocean out past the Golden Gate. Determined to start a new life out west, far out west, San Francisco, Oakland, Berkeley, Mill Valley, Sausalito, nonstop performances, visits, travels, Berkeley, 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 1968, still 1969 in Berkeley, powwow with Einstein of the sacred herb, peace pipe opens magic realms, then cross campus to most bookstore beat. Beat, beat, and I'm searching for Jack Kerouac, the one who'll shake the ones unshaken, the fearless one, the one without bullshit. I cast off the anxiety for the influence and make myself new, breathing in salty sea breezes. My lungs and heart are healed, writing the heart. I have escaped my mental sanctum where for too long I contemplated longing, lost grief, my complicated navel. I have finally pulled my head out of my ass. I am born again. My new church is my body in which my soul dwells now. Wherever I am, I am in church. My soul, my spirit, my heart sing songs of praise. I give thanks for each and every moment, event, person, being. I give thanks for the pain, suffering, joy, happiness, all and everything have brought me to this moment, this fleeting moment. Life flies by, no sense holding on to what is gone. Last breath will arrive soon enough. Searching for Jack Kerouac, bones, white bones, buried coast to coast, ghost to ghost. Far seeing, staring at me from the other side, Jack Kerouac, staring at me, writing this poem and searching for Jack Kerouac. I declare that Henceforth and forevermore, I will do nothing but sing songs of praise, of thanks, of joy, of happiness. Even if I die in a gutter with a bullet in my head, I'll die singing songs of praise. And I'm searching for Jack Kerouac, Moe's Bookstore, Berkeley Bird, Bird and Beckett Books, City Lights, Cafe Trias, Cafe Greco, North Beach, San Francisco, Sausalito, Mill Valley, Oakland, nonstop performances, visits, travels. I bid farewell to ye, oh, holy, far out left coast and searching for Jack Kerouac on the plane, I read the only people that interest me are the mad ones, the ones who are mad to live, mad to talk, desire everything at the same time. The ones that never yawn or say a commonplace thing, but burn, burn, burn like Roman candles and peering through the clouds. I see Jack's smiling face and he whispers from the distance. One night in America, when the sun had gone down, beginning at four of the winter afternoon in New York, by shedding a beautiful burnished gold in the air that made dirty old buildings look like the walls of the temple of the world, then out flying its own shades as it raced 3,200 miles over raw, bulging land to the west coast before sloping down the Pacific, leaving the great rear guard shroud of night to creep upon our earth to darken rivers to cup the peaks and fold the final shore in. I'm searching, yes, after all these years, still searching for myself. At 71, I'm folding the final shore in, still searching for the ever elusive Jack. That's right. I said, Jack, Jack Kerouac. I'm searching for Jack Kerouac. Thank you.
Hello everybody, my name is Pankuri Sinha. I'm from India. I'm very happy to be part of this 100th birthday celebration of the speed poet Jack Kariwak. Thank you so much to Debbie Ma'am. This is a poem that I just wrote for him. I've only met you, dear sir, Jack. I come from an altogether different literary tradition of a different language, which you seem to be so familiar with. Adapting, customizing, creating Ray Smith's story. Well versed with Zen Buddhism, performing Yabyam rituals after the orgy of drunken parties, adding the dimension of sublime transcendence, giving birth to the typically beat post war hippie counter culture. And I'm so delighted to meet you, dear sir. You see, I also come from this old fashioned culture of calling our loved ones, sir and ma'am, of respecting things so much as to never really question and certainly not doing any real fusion. But I loved it when my American teachers said, and I'll quote my favorite one, who taught Latin American history, please call me Cal. I also love all of these mountains. <laughs> I also love all of these and peaks and crosslands. Wait a sec, wait a sec, wait a second. Let's start that over. Bangs, you have to mute yourself. Sorry, Mrs. Okay. Someone had the... Uh, okay. Go ahead, start your second poem now. Go um, ahead. This is actually a single piece. Okay, go ahead. So should I read all over again or should I just start from in between? Start from where you just were, just where you were. We'll edit it in. Start okay. uh, some, some before, okay? And I will cut it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I will quote my favorite one who taught Latin American history. Please call me Hal. I also love all of these mountains and peaks and crosslands where I think the soul of your nation lies and where I think you take your characters to heal, recuperate. So many of these exotic locales of your writing are still on my list. And yet they quite simply propel us on the road to Big Sur and other destinations where the cedar trees smile endlessly, humming a sweet note to the roaring ocean, locked in a timeless frame of ageless beauty and endless peace, propelling us on the road, even if it makes us desolate angels. The subterraneans are folks in Dr. Sachs. But there's so much more we've met at a time of war, one that turned you into a writer. And I do wish to ask you about Mexico City blues, but just an overwhelming coincidence. The way you say, I tell you it's October, is exactly how I remember it. Away from that land of olden, golden, strange, ancestral light may continue to burn bright. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Chouchou Maldemer. I'm French, of course. You can hear that. Um, I read the uh, Kerouac when I was in my teens and I uh, read a lot of things when I was in my teens. Um, I didn't write a particular piece on Kerouac. Uh, you do it so well. I also f f find that uh, uh, it's a very American um, uh, uh, affair, if you like. Um, though, personally, uh, I think I'm his, his incarnation because all he is about, I am about as well. So my, I didn't write anything in particular about Kerouac and my pieces are not new. But uh, I want to speak about drugs. So, and um, agony. Uh, so there we are. It runs called agony and ecstasy. It is too, it is difficult to believe that all I am going through for the last 10 days is for my good. 
I'm getting reaction from reflexology Olive gives me every Monday for the last three weeks. So on this recession and I am in agony. Oh, not so much physical as mental. Of course, and obviously I feel physically foul, so vulnerable and fragile. I don't know if I come or I go. My nerves are so frayed. I feel so weary. I mean, so very hysterical, ethereal, sorry. Um, anyone could blow me away so it is easily. It is such a strange feeling. One that surrendered to willingly, I'm sure, if I lived in the countryside, the small town by the sea, where one is not bombarded constantly with all the very strange otherness outside there. It is too much input, London, and not just input. It is mainly heavy and sad and depressed, poor in spirit, poor in love, lonely and frightened and angry. I can't stand that feeling, all this greedy spirited routine day after day. I believe, I believe people take drugs to be nearer the angels. I reckon that a, by not being like anywhere else, anyone else, they're different, by which I mean it mentally gives them a sense of worth, of uniqueness. It can lead to a greater understanding for better or for worse. B, no one in their right mind would take substances that can be dangerous physically or mentally if they didn't find a reward somewhere. Everyone against drug will tell you of their dangers, the terrible effects, but no one will tell you of their delights and benefits, which are many and very real and well worth the agony, or it seems at the time, definitely. And I must add, for the sake of truth, now that I have stopped taking them, I do it all over again, and I do miss them a lot. They were fun, great to do in, in the outside, in the sun, shared. And they were great tools for self-discovery and a larger understanding of things. They gave an edge to everything, a depth, sharpness, more real than not. They helped tap in all the resources within oneself, oneself and give another light to everything, another deeper meaning and worth to one's life. Drugs are great. Life spoiled my drugs. I know, early 70s. Do you remember this um, quote? There are another quote, which is, um, life is hard and then you die which is another British uh, thing. The agony which needn't be, the mental agony created by the fear and negativity of others you pick up, the reprobation, criticism, and finally your own, because it is catching the opinion of others. And either you agree with them, you're shit, or you disagree with them, and you're a rebel. The physical agony, which is mainly caused by the fact that for as long as they, they are big business, as long as they're illegal, no drugs will get to you clean and mix with all sorts of rubbish to flood them up. That's why it really, really fucks up the body up. And as long as they, as they cost the moon, people will have to crave for it a little or a lot, depending on their finances, whether they can afford them or not. And I wrote that in 1993. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Rescue Poetics out of Jersey City, New Jersey. And it's an honor to be here among this esteemed group of poets uh, sharing Jack Kerouac's 100th um, 
anniversary of life, I guess you would call it, birthday. So this piece that I have is kind of inspired by the relationship that uh, seems to have gone through all of the themes that everything that Jack Kerouac has done. And I took a little bit of that and made it very personal. You are my mantra. Beyond what my eyes tell me through and through your heart and beyond to who you are. Stitching and thread rugged lines that make your silhouette look past colored mirrors, colored glass, intense echoes sing back, lines etched with experience, love, and life lessons. You are my mantra. The thing I say to myself every day, not with eyes of surface, blind to human design, of accepted composure. You are my mantra. My voice is in you, intonations of knowing over and over, curves and curls of teeth and tongue, your voice in my head, chanting, chanting softly. I am freedom. Living along the edges of my eyes so that every turn is lined with you, the color of you. That smile, I gladly work to set free. That thought that opens my eyes in the morning, smiling before I even know why. Chanting, chanting, I am freedom. Focus that gives me strength, energy that breathes length, into the smallest of pleasures, from the tiniest of measures, that one voice that joins mine, my mantra. Reach beneath the surface to a renewed sense of purpose, chanting softly through me, chanting in me. With the sounds of the universe, I hear your mantra, your voice, the guide of finding myself within chanting, chanting. From you, I have gained wisdom. With you, I have learned the custom of loving and accepting what is. I am freedom. Infinite possibilities open with each verse woven through fibers of my being in terms of freeing, rethinking the common, reassessing the forgotten, discovering my tones in the universe of sounds. I am Freedom. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm William F. DeVault. Uh, known as the Romantic Poet of the Internet, also U.S. National Beat Poet Laureate Emeritus. Um, speaking today for the 100th birthday of Jack Kerouac, or more accurately, Jean-Louis Kerouac. Um, I had a tough time picking the poem for this. Most of my poems were way too long for the window we were doing, and I don't want to break the pattern and screw up the timing. So I asked a friend of mine who's a college professor to take a look at 10 or 20 of my better known poems and pick the one that most sounds like the way Kerouac wrote. It's not exact, but it's close enough. And I think that's a, that's a proper salute to him. And it's called Santa Ana Winds. Like a wave of fire descending in judgment, burning me to the quick, thick with self-denial, the trial of the romantic, seeking truth in the shallows of the rainforest, poorest of the depths having slept with the demons, awakened to the silence and forsworn the violence in the best Udeo Christian traditions, made proof of the truth of a lie, accepted with a smile. While, all the while, knowing that in a medicated haze, all praise is lies. Pray for the wind. Pray it will not be defiled by this child of my blackened heart, that my final torment will not be as epic as the tragedy of false hopes, fed the bread bought at borders, filling chalices with the urine of mad marketers, made rich on pain gained at the cost of the children. 
and I will ride the winds, even if the only vector left is down, down to the foot of the cliffs of the legends. Pray for the wind. Thank you very much. And wherever you are, Jack, hi. Hi, everybody. This meeting is being recorded. Hi, everybody. I'm happy to be joining you from the state of Maine in the USA. And though I'm joining you from Maine, I grew up in a town only 18 miles from Lowell. And I think ever since I have been searching for a poet in a lumberjack shirt. Today, I'm going to read a little bit from you from this book called Jack Kerouac's Book of Haikus, His Deliberate Use of the Plural. And then a couple of my own to end with. The summer chair rocking by itself in the blizzard. February gales racing westward through the clouds, the moon. Among the nervous birds, the morning dove nibbles quietly. Cold gray tufts of winter grass under the stars. Meme says, Planets are far apart, so people can't bother each other. In the quiet house, my mother's moaning yawns. Blizzard in the suburbs, the mailman and the poet walking. Blizzard in the suburbs, old men driving slowly to the store three blocks. Dusk. The blizzard hides everything, even the night. Mild spring night, a teenage girl said, good evening in the dark. I said a joke under the stars, no laughter. Hot tea in the cold moonlit snow, a burp. Windows rattling in the wind. I'm a lousy lover. The falling snow, the hissing radiators, the bride out there. And the last of his I'll read. A long way down from the beat generation in the rainforest. And these are a few of my own American pops from my newest book. This is called A Lockdown Day in Haiku. My lonely old pug, so distressed in normal times, loving the lockdown. My well-meaning cat presents a freshly killed mouse, not expecting screams. My America, burning and crumbling, the pug snores peacefully. My dog, tight tree buds, twittering birds, the sap man, beseeching spring's grace. Dead tree in the yard, a pileated woodpecker finds much life within. Ever patient moon sits quietly far above as the earth smolders. Thank you. Hi guys. Um, I'm Annie. I'm in Colorado where it's sunny and gorgeous and um i think i think the thing about jack, jack Kerouac that you know i read him when i was young and i i think that the thing i like most about him is the voice he gave to the fodder um i was identifying with the fodder myself it all it made me feel like an eloquent voice was telling tales of fodder life while still dipping a toe in. Um, you know, um, I know Sylvia Plath wrote about her desire always to want to be free to mingle with the railroad men and the people hanging out anonymously. And I think that Jack Kerouac was able to give a voice to the almost normalcy of life of a whole different segment of society and to me that was really a freeing thing so my poem is called was let mary magdalene asks jack and sylvia 
Hey, it was last night Easter? The relief last night was tangible. It poured out liquid, solid and pungent and an agonizing as the belly pain being pressed to the cold of the floor, but more surreal, endless as the moments that process such torment, yet oddly dissociated, time traveled, as if some other galaxy had swept in on nights, swirling stars engulfing me in its spiral arms, allowing me both presence and absence in the exhale of one sharp birthing breath. Escape, my head bangs in the morning, refill stuffs all remaining belongings that are ours back into my tin can head. What could be more cathartic really? The near death pains, convulsing expansion contraction of late night floors, adding my love to the same gaping porcelain mama mouth that took away the sins of the world. When you, when you, as any Van Gogh, offered up your own bloody ear. The one, the one, me smeared with dressed in argument as dense as a Gauguin brown, painting with only mangled fingers from ass to all tea, kettled as dream in the persistence inherent in the sweet lust of vomit-scented hair. And then finally, the victory lap from spinning laundry to bed, walk without my broken body spilling, not even one more drop, cleansed as foot washed as Jesus, waiting in the wake of my bed for my lover to roll away the stone. Thank you. Uh, this is Carlo Parcelli from uh, Washington, DC. Us natives call it the, uh, call it Satan's anus. And um, <clears throat> I'm going to read uh, just a couple of uh, short segments from uh, uh, 600 or 700 line poem, uh, uh, one of 22 monologues that will appear in a forthcoming book uh, published by Venetian Spider Press. Um, and, the, and the title of this, this monologue is Peter Doyle's Suicide Letter to Walt Whitman. And uh, Peter Doyle was one of Walt Whitman's uh, two major lovers, major, major heartthrobs in his life. And uh, he wrote a suicide letter to Walt Whitman, which has been lost, was apparently through Whitman and his and Whitman's landlady into a panic. So because uh, we know the letter was lost because Whitman wrote a letter back to Doyle. So what I've done is I've imagined what Peter Doyle wrote to Walt Whitman at that time. And is, this is just a little brief um, taste of it. <clears throat> Peter Doyle's suicide letter to Walt Whitman. Such be my proposal of love from which you often turn from yourself and in way of forbearance turn from me, as in your last letter. So my proposal of necessity, that our desire be to be together, most lie in a pact with death. Your poems make me sick with grief, that you would so celebrate the forces that sunder us, or praise thee, that scoundrel Johnson, what set gray dogs upon freemen as they set upon you branded as ham be and so touched by God. No, Lincoln, no Lincoln come to free us like the niggers and ask them what asset be this freedom among these shit heels. And for centuries to come, as my eyes be the measure and not some blind ambition of poetry, a poesy to myself. And you so far adrift, it goes only in words. Ask, fucking ask that black man what he say, and from what tree, before you loot the oratory of Ward Beecher and Cassius Clay. What you and I share, when in your palm you bugger Lincoln, dead and not yet in his grave, that little black thing in the white, the dusky spot, and thus disguised, charm the public. Yet by every kiss stolen, you make me a thief. Even now, I cannot speak frankly, lest I rouse the petty terror in my fellow men to confirm the dread they imbue within me. I honor greater spirits, more tenderly served every day. 
in silence. I honor the rafters above my door that call me to peace. I honor the rope. I honor the chair kicked out in spasm. That's it. done. Aaron Lee here, Beat Poet Laureate of New Hampshire. I'm gonna read two short poems. The first one is called Ain't Beat. Ain't beat like Jack, ain't beat like Brodigan, ain't beat like Jazz, ain't beat like Toni Morrison. Ain't beat on my outside, miss beat, by timing, only beat by resistance found my beat rhyming. Ain't beat by drinking, ain't beat by same sex, ain't beat by thinking I'm different than the rest. Things make me beat like the inner struggle, like the never feel of fit in. Got life hard and double. I wear the mantle beat well as any other. Sweet feel of a family, sister with brother. The second poem was recently accepted into the upcoming beat anthology, I'm happy to say. It was written after the movie, Nomad Land. The desert on wheels and all was sunny, parched earth and the need for money. Beaten, spit out, still upright, drive to a campsite, spend the night. Bucket for a shithole, circle round the fire. If you ain't hurting, you're the liar. Goodness comes too late, you'd rather be alone, living it out in nature as she guides you on home. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tommy Twilight. I have two poems for you today. First one is Blade of Grass. Ubiquitous, sheaves of wheat, rye, zoysia, timothy, Kentucky blue. What is grass? It's you. But what are these leaves of grass when they are blades? Blades of grass. Grass covers all, Carl Sandburg. It covers all. Blades of steel in civil war, razor blades of high fashion to sharpen and steel, dull or glinting, coming up from dirt, digging down into the cracks, hiding beneath the snow. Tundra, permafrost, cold, desert grass, sea grass, wind blown, the green, green grass of home. Some of us just minding our own beeswax, waiting for the bees. Just be, being, waiting, being time, day into night, seasons, years, watching. We are our own food, a few drops of rain or dew, that blessed light and we live to be mown down by scythe or chewed, digested, expelled as manure to be made green again. Wander. And we wander, how we wander, seed heads blown on the wind, empty specks of dried life, ground into flour, baked into bread, carried by rain down rivers and streams, flown on the wing in the pure guano of bird and bat, scattered surreptitiously to hold the earth in the fine hair of our tendrils, voiceless, the sound we make is the rustle of wind, meaningless. Silence screams at frequencies no God can hear, without ears or mouth. Thin, tiny, bodiless, insubstantial existence without dumb, deaf, blind, only soul of spirit somewhere within. Can it be that we are grass, 
always wanting more. In my second piece, um, I uh, dedicate this to the people in Ukraine and all uh, refugees. Your rags are my trumpet call. Your rags are my trumpet call, your hunger, my sacred song. I await your knock on my door. I'm still waiting. I'm not tear gas or barbed wire. I'm not a wall or a rifle scope. I'm not a cage. At least I pray that I am not. I will open the door and let you in. The tear gas burns my eyes. The barbed wire leaves scars, but I will not die. The wall will not stop me. Together we climb the wall. Together we tear it down. May my tears satisfy your thirst. May my cry help you sing. I smash this rifle, throw it into the river to rust. I break this cage, set you free. Together we will sing. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm the former Beat Poet Laureate for Florida. And I have a couple of pieces I'd like to read today. But I come by being Beat Poet really naturally. As young as the age of seven, I was dressed up for Halloween as a beatnik. You should have seen the look on my mama's face. Playing my life like jazz, smooth. But then I improvise, I don't know what's going to come out of my mind, but when it does, I am electrified. You see, I'm walking the streets with a certain something in my strut. I'm always on the move because I got somewhere to go. I don't mean to be offensive. I don't put up with bullshit. Sometimes I brush people wrong, even when I'm right. Guess I'm just made that way. I sit down to the keyboard and start humming along with the words. There is a sound between the letters I want to capture, to enrapture. I am a poet and the music emits from the verbs. It comes from the words in a force of plenty, yet gentle as all that soft breeze that calls your name. This old jazz guy I knew, Tommy was his name, played jazz accordion like he was born with keys instead of fingers. He told me I wrote with the black keys. He was talking about the words I would pop because they resonated different than anyone else's. I'll never forget that. I like the way my words do that digging deep beneath the nomenclature, finding that word song, recapturing lives and giving them hope. I don't mean to sound pretentious. I just like to give folks courage to enter their own convictions and live lives, and live lives filled with generosity of spirit, spooky stuff from someone who knows. I play my life like jazz, even when my fingers are rusty, as they form prayers on wheels. I have faith in something, not sure what it is. I just have faith in something, playing my life like jazz. And the next piece is called Dressing Like a Refugee. You were never stylish in your haberdashery, but you had a certain blue collar wariness, a worker je ne sais quoi. Now you've run out of clothes that fit, even your skin seems too big for your body as it hangs and sags in every direction. Today, you dress like a refugee plaid flannel shirt that was in style at the turn of last century. And, and it has to have two pockets to hold your valuable papers, recipes for antique vegetables, a notebook to record every penny spent, and Lord knows what you carefully stuff into those pockets. You remind me of a homeless person, possessions stuffed into plastic bags and an aged shopping cart with shrieking alarms to put fear into anyone who would touch their property. Today you wear ancient corduroys, at least six sizes too big. They fit you when you were vigorous, 
but you have shrunken down to the core. These cords swish even when you are sitting still. You belt them so tightly. Clinched at the waist, a body without waist. I never thought you would dress like a refugee, a man whose pockets beckon to be picked, but are as empty as your heart has grown cold. I remember you with strong spirit, a workaholic before it became fashionable. Now I don't recognize you, a curmudgeon whose spirit is lost, an alien, a man who dresses like a refugee. Hi, I'm Edward Corelli from snowy cold spring in the Northeast right now. I shoveled four inches of snow this morning. So these, both these poems, short poems were, were um, uh, inspired by, um, by On the Road. Uh, so here they are. Okay. This is uh, called There'll Be Monsters and Dragons. Free-spirited, unbridled, wild child, connection clear, undefined roles of lost souls, Boundaries crossed, friendships lost, the wraps of infidelity strikes hard, fine dying, great booze and wine, our treasures of passion, naked souls abound, masks that fool no one. Thursday night, drunken flight, hotel, botel, grove to the pines, Monday, red eye, blind to the shine, sand or concrete couldn't tell the difference. The road home from oblivion is never clear, never cheap, and never hidden. All that's revealed in darkness will eventually find its way to the light. Uh, and my second poem is, is uh, called um, A Dance Less Traveled. Unpaved road, rock and roll with each bump. Every ditch, toss, turn, thump. Bump and grind, hugging at each bend. Hands in the air, blinding light. Radio broken, jerk side to side. Luminous sighs to draw you closer. Bump, jump, hold on tight. You join in sight, pause and sit one out for the night. Chicken roasted, cornbread toasted, pork ribs, beef ribs, corn, fresh corn on the cob, that'll do the job. A feast to behold, music to my ears. The journey ends, our dance begins. Thank you so much.